Hello once again, this is Bruce Wallenberg. This is Lecture 13A, which is Part 1 of the two lectures on Power System State Estimation. The idea of uh, state estimation is, is as follows. Uh, can we use measurements uh, of the system? Now, by, by measurements, uh, I mean we could measure P uh, flowing on a transmission line, Q. Uh, I can measure V. Uh, we'll see later on in the, the end of the second lecture that there's now the ability to actually measure bus phase angles. But if I, I can I use measurements to figure out the state of the system. Now by state uh, I mean the, the voltage magnitude and phase angle of an operating power system. Um, the term state variables comes from uh, the control system folks. The state variables are those basic variables that can be used to calculate everything else. Okay, uh, Position, velocity, etc., etc. Those are, those are uh, uh, state variables. Well, in the power system, it's the voltage magnitude and phase angle of every bus. And from that I can calculate all the flows, the p-gen, the loads, everything Everything comes out of that. Uh, the, the problem is as follows. Um, and and let, let's go in his, historically, um, way back when, before online computer systems and, and uh, state estimators and so forth, the, they decided that they were going to they were going to get a power flow and match it against a uh, an operating uh, condition. So you sent people to the substations and they synchronized their watches or whatever clocks they were using, and at precisely some time, let's say 12 noon on a Friday, they took down all the measurements. They wrote them down and voltages, power, reactive, everything that was measured in the substation, every substation generating plant, they brought all that data back and they gave it to the engineers and they said now make a power flow that matches those measured values and they couldn't, they couldn't, it was all over the place and it it, it wasn't until uh, the late 1960s that a professor from MIT named Fred Schweppe took a summer off uh, from MIT and he worked with uh, American Electric Power whose offices were then in New York City. They're now in Columbus, Ohio, but uh, he worked with AEP and he said, you know, this is a very similar problem to tracking a missile with radar. Uh, we get readings of azimuth and distance and angles and so forth from the radar and uh, we get multiple radars and the problem is that uh, we, 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 we need a way to take all these measured data and come out with a track that, that, that's accurate as to where the missile actually is at any particular time. And uh, he had worked on those problems uh, for the government and uh, he said he's going to tackle this, and he came out with this this uh, state estimation. Uh, it's uh, it's credited to him as being the the first to get into doing this. So the problem the problem with just using measurements is that measurements have errors. The measurement uh, themselves are are not perfectly calibrated. Uh, they they may have something physically wrong with them, and they have errors. Uh, we don't always measure as many things as necessary, so you may you may have some lack of measurements. Some measurements are actually bad, meaning that uh, they're not just off by a little error, they're off by uh, a lot. A typical error, very typical, is that the measurement is hooked up backwards. The, yeah, the, the plus terminal went to the minus and the minus terminal went to the plus and uh, they get a reading back and, and engineers were astounded when they first hooked up state estimators because they found lots of different measure, measurement values which they had read for years 
and accepted and turned out they were backwards. It was not measuring flow in one direction, it was measuring it in the opposite direction and so on and so forth. So um, those are sometimes the, the initially, um, I, think, I think it's a sort of universally uh, uh, found that when you first hook up a state estimator and you have a system to bring the, the data back in and to, uh, to model your power system, that it takes a lot of effort to clean up, <laughs> get rid of all those reversed measurements, get the bad measurements out and so forth. Okay, here is an example. We have um, a system here that has three buses, one, two, three. Uh, this is the reference bus down here and uh, its its phase angle is equal to so the phase angle on three equals zero and we measure we, we actually then have two unknowns we that the unknowns are theta two and theta one and we have we have three measurements m one two m one three and m three two we have three measurements so if I take uh, and I give you these measurements, I say, okay, M, M13 over here is equal to 5, and M32 is equal to 40. Then just knowing those two measurements, don't even need this one over here, the M12. I set up the equations for, for F13, which is 1 over X3, X1 minus X3, that must equal the value of M13 or 0.05 per unit. Same thing for the F32, the flow on 32 is, is this, is a function of the two variables theta3 minus theta2. And I have two equations in two unknowns. I can solve for the uh, radian value and then I can compute the flows. Now, I, let's come back here. And it, and it turns out that because these were perfect measurements, when I did this, every, everything that it calculates matches up to what's really happening on the system. Um, no trouble whatsoever about that. So the problem comes along when, in fact, uh, instead of getting perfect measurements, I get measurements with errors. Instead of this being 5, it's 6. Instead of this being 40, it's 37. This is 62. Those are the measurements that I'm getting, and there's some, there's some noise in there. Well, if I use the, the M13 and the M32 as I did before, I get the following solution. I get this. This matches the, the 37. This matches the 6. So I've, I've matched this value and this value. Oh, but I, when I do all the calculation of all the power flows, I get 58.25. Well, that's not 62. It's off by uh, 4 megawatts, or a little under 4, 4 megawatts. Well, that's no good. So you say, okay, um, let's do it differently. So now I'm going to measure, I'm going to use M12, I'm going to use this one, and M32. I'm going to do that. So now I match the 62, I match the 37. Oh boy. And what I get over here is 7.875. It doesn't match the 6. Remember I got a a measurement up there uh, of six on on that M13 bus. So I can't I can't reconcile this. Um, I've got three three me measurements, and I only need to estimate two states. And I can't I can't do it by just picking two of the measurements and letting it solve, and then looking back at the third measurement, it, it comes out quite wrong. So we need a better process to do this. And what we're going to talk about here is, is a statistical method called the maximum likelihood state estimation. And I'm going to use the simplest, dumbest example I could think of. <laughs> I, 
I have a voltage, and I don't know what the voltage is. It's X. It does a true value. I have a, a, an ammeter here that measures current, and the current it's measuring is Z1, and I have an R1. We will assume that I know the value of the, of the resistance, that it's a very accurate resistance, and I don't need to worry that there's error in R. So I get the value R1. Well, if I know the current through here, if I know that current, I, then I times R right here gives me the voltage equals IR, Ohm's Law. I put a capital R, should have been small, but that doesn't matter. Then that voltage should be the same as this X. So, let's take this and we say, all right, I'm going to do maximum likelihood state estimation. I get this, and here's the problem. The measurement has got a true value of the current, but it adds a little error to it. And the error just is just because of uh, st the statistical error. And, and, and in this physical uh, meter, uh, there's a little bit of error. And it's going to be represented, the, the, uh, the error itself, by a normal distribution with a, with a standard deviation of sigma 1. So here it says that the, the PDF of that measurement is the, the difference Z measured minus Z true. Okay, that's, that's this. Ep, eta equals Z measured minus Z true squared over 2 sigma 1 squared all raised up to the, the uh, that's a power, that's an exponent on E. That's what this expression EXP means. Well, the Z true is 1 over R times the voltage X, okay? Later on, you're going to see me talk about the difference between the measured value and the calculated. Now, notice here, the Z true is the calculated, and it's calculated. If I knew what X was, well, then the current calculated would be X times 1 over R, okay? Act, act, the current is, is V over R or X over R1. So if I differentiate this calculated value from the Z1 mes, <coughs> I get a normal distribution. Now the maximum likelihood method says I maximize the probability of obtaining the measured value by adjusting the unknown value X. That's, that's what it is. So I said, OK, well, what's the probability? Well, if you integrate the probability density function as dz approaches 0, then it's the probability is the value at z1 measurement times this dz. And to maximize that with respect to x is to maximize this PDF times dz. And it turns out it's easier to maximize the, the natural log because then I can I don't have to fool around with that EXP function. So if I, I'm going to maximize the natural log, I come out with this, minus LN. I've got this 2, sig, two sigma 1, 2 pi, radical 2 pi. And here's my Z mes minus X times 1 over R1 squared. And this is the same as this is the same as just minimizing this. This part out in the front is, is, is constant. So all I have to do is minimize this. I have to minimize this function right here. And to minimize it, I'll take the derivative of the mes minus x over r1. I'll take derivative with respect to x and I get I get this. And that is equal to zero when x is equal to z mes times r1. Well, that's what we would expect. I mean, with only one measurement, that's going to be the only value that you could conclude anyway, is that the estimate of x is the measured current times r1. So this didn't really show, didn't really prove much. Now, 
I'm going to change the problem just slightly. I'm going to put I'm going to put two meters, one and two. There's there's two resistors that I know very accurately, and the two meters each have their own error characteristic, and it could be that one of them's a very good meter, one of them's a not so good meter. Doesn't matter. So now I have the PDF for Z1 and the PDF for Z2. And now I need to know what's the maximum likelihood of getting Z1 and Z2. Those are the two values that I got. Well, that's in, in the probability theory that says that's the probability of Z1 times the probability of Z2, or the product of their PDFs. So it's this one, and then we've got this, this x down here. So it's this times this, and I've got these dz's stuck on the back. And when I do the maximum uh, with, without going through all the math, when I maximize the probability of getting this, look what I get. I get the thing that I have to minimize is this function that's the z1 minus 1 over r times x squared and z2 times 1 over r2 times x. Now, the book actually goes through and calculates what that, what that value is. I'm actually much more interested in this function. Notice what this is. And the twos can, can come out. Here it is down here. It says you take each measurement and you difference it with the calculated value as a function of x. This is what we're, x is the number we're trying to get. So I differentiate, I difference the measured value with, the, with that value calculated, and I square it, divide it by the square of the standard deviation, and I just add them up. So this is called a minimum sums of square, minimum sum of squares, or more likely least, or more easily pronounced, least squares, but it's, we have a function j of x, and so it says to get the best x, minimize j of x that minimizes this, this sum of squares, okay? It's the sum of the squares. This is called the error. This is the error between the measured value and whatever we end up with x, that's the calculated. And you square it, and you divide it by the square of the standard deviation. So. I can, let, let's come back now and say, well, f, now in, in, in the previous one, the f was just x over r, or depending on which resistor. But let's say that the, the f of a particular measurement is a linear sum over all the state variables x. Or you can say that uh, then that the, the, the each, F value, which is all the measurements we're going to have, this is the NM, is the number of measurements, is equal to a matrix H times the vector X of state variables, and I have Z measurements. Well, this can be written then, the sum of the squares then is a, ma is a, is a set of, where this is a, a, a vector, this is a vector, and we transpose them, and we multiply by R inverse, and, and we go through that in a minute, times the same vector minus vector. R is just sigma squared along the diagonals like this. It's a ma matrix, a big, big square matrix, but only terms on the diagonal. And of course, the inverse of R is just 1 over x1 squared and so forth. Now, the least square solution of that, and the one that we're, that, that we're interested in, is this one here when the number of states is less than the number of measurements, then the maximum likelihood comes out to be this. This expression, which we derive in the book, H transpose R inverse H, that's, a, that's one matrix, and you invert that matrix times H transpose R inverse Z. Um, this is called a pseudo inverse. It's got the name pseudo inverse, and it gives you the exact least squares solution for linear uh, uh, a linear system like that. And um, it, it 
turns out that if, if the number of states is equal to the number of measurements, well, then the solution is you just multiply H inverse times Z measurement. And you get this, uh, this X est. If the number of states is greater than the, the number of, of, of measurements, then I can, I can do this. Um, it's a vector that minimizes the norm that fits the measured quantities to the measurements exactly. Uh, that sounds ridiculous, but it's, it, it, it can be done that way. You, it basically, it says, well, I, I, if, if I have more states than measurements, then there's, there's a whole family of solutions for x, for the estimated x. So I'll find the one that has the, 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 the least norm or the least magnitude. Uh, that fits the the z -mat. This is not a case that we're that we're at all interested in. <clears throat> it turns out that you always want to have more measurements than states, and the more measurements, the better. The more measurements, the better. Uh, uh, I'm estimating the uh, the states. So if I have uh, a, a power system and I have, let's say. Uh, a thousand buses. Well, the voltage and phase angle on the uh, reference bus are considered known, so I have, what's that, 998 states. Um, I would like three or four thousand measurements. Then I could really get an accurate uh, idea of what the states are. Okay, let's go back to my old three bus system again. So here's my excess. It's the theta 1 and theta 2. And I have three measurement equations. Oh, and by the way, these are linear. Here they are here. There's the linear functions in terms of theta 1 and theta 2. So here's my H matrix. There's the H matrix. And it turns out to be, um, it comes right from these, these F, these flow equations, which come from the linear power flow. Here they are. R has three values like this in the, in the diagonal. And here's the, the measurement, 62, 6, and 37. When I put them in, notice now um, the, um, the value up here is not 62. The value here is not 6. And the value here is not um, 37. It's closer, 37.7. But they're all off by a little bit. But they're all within. They're all getting closer. They're all getting closer. So I've managed to to move the the uh, measurements, and this minimizes the weighted sum of the squares of the errors. So I've I've actually taken all three measurements into account, and the the estimated state and the estimated flows are are much more accurate than the, than they would be if you just took two of them the way we did before. Now if I go to an AC um, network, an AC network, well then the minimum of J is the same function that we used before, except that where we have a meg megawatt measurement, we have this, this great big nonlinear function. And I have that squared divided by the megawatt measurement sigma. And then I have the megavar minus another long equation. And I have that squared divided by sigma. And here it is for, for the voltage. It's just voltage magnitude minus magnitude over the sigma. Now, the problem is that those are nonlinear functions. So what we do is we take and we build the Jacobian of all of these measurements. And we say that the Jacobian represents the matrix H. This represents the matrix R. And Z minus F is what we're trying to drive uh, to the minimum. So our Jacobian then looks like like this, and we we just got we're just going to say okay, drive this to to uh, to zero or to 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 a solution using Newton's method. Well, Newton's method we take the derivative of this gradient, invert it, 
times times this. And here we get this H transpose R inverse H times H transpose R inverse times Z minus F, where once again H is this matrix of derivatives and the matrix R is this matrix of, of 1 over sigma. And so the, the solution of it says we, we solve, we, we get a, an initial starting point for X for our voltages and phase angles. I solve for uh, all the errors. I calculate the H matrix, the H transpose R inverse H, the inverse of that matrix. Multiply that times H transpose R inverse times the error vector and I get a delta X. I add the delta X to X and I go back and I do it again and I do it again until things just stop changing. It converges. And that's the least squares estimate, but it's on a nonlinear AC power flow system. Here's an example from our, here's our, our friendly six bus system where we've got the, the MV3, that's the, the uh, measurement of voltage. Here's measurement of generation. Here's measurement of flow on 3.5 and so forth. And I've got um, measurement down here, ML for the measurement of load. So I've got measurements. And th this is really well measured. I measured each generation. I measure each load. Uh, I measure each generation, each uh, flow on every line at both ends. So it's got a lot of measurements. Here's the result. So um, I, put, um, I put the base case up here. And the measured values have slight errors. We use a random number generator uh, distributed as a normal function, and we've got the, the, the values here measured, and then the estimated uh, ones over here. And this is an, a table that's, that's, in the, that's in the textbook, and that's the numerical results of, uh, of solving, uh, solving that. Uh, I want to present a, a very special problem. This, this came up. Uh, it came up the first time I, I wrote uh, and uh, built a state estimator for a power company. This problem came up and it, and it, it wasn't solved by the industry until we, they introduced something called the orthogonal reduction method. Here's the problem. Suppose that uh, I have over here a bus and the bus has no load or generation on it. It's just whatever flows in, flows through the bus and flows out. And so we say the net injection, the net load and generation is zero on the bus. And there's a lot of those buses in the power system, believe me. Now the problem is that I don't need to, I don't need to build a measurement to tell me that this is zero. I know it's zero and I know that it is zero to, to many places of accuracy, if you want to say it that way. But I would like to force the solution to have zero for the net on this bus. I have a flow measurement uh, in here, M12 is equal to 32, and uh, here's, here's M32 is equal to 72, and so I, I can solve this. Okay, and if and the, the, the actual solution uh, has 29.41 flowing all the way around here. This one has a value of 32. This one has a value of 72. There's actually 70.59. I'm just putting 100 megawatts in, in here and taking it out up here at the load. So it's a very simple loop. But I want to use the measurements so that this one comes out to be zero. Well, here is uh, here's the issue. When I solve this and I say, okay, this is this is a value of zero, and I solve this using my normal um, pseudo inverse least squares method uh, state estimate, I get an injection of 0.82 on the bus. Well. I know that it's zero. Don't tell me it's 0.82. Well, what 
what we did initially is we said, okay, just make the weighting of this measurement very, very high. So here's here's my uh, the same H matrix as before, but the R. See what I did? I said, okay, you want a big weighting? This one is going to have 10 to the minus 20. It has a very, very good weighting. And the trouble then is that when you do H transpose R inverse H, this matrix is very nearly singular. When you go to invert it, if you're using MATLAB, you get all kinds of error messages out that says, warning, this is a nearly singular matrix. And in fact, when you go to invert a nearly singular matrix, the, mat the inverse you get out of it is, is often garbage. And so you get an estimate that's garbage too. So you can't really solve with that by, by putting this big uh, value uh, in here of, uh, of 20. You can't make its weight so high. So now along came uh, some several researchers and they, they, they read a lot of literature on, on least squares and, and discovered that there was another method called orthogonal decomposition. Here's the secret of it. We take and we take r to the minus one half. We take the, the square root of, of r and we take uh, its inverse, multiply that times h, we call that h prime. And then we say, well, h prime is equal to a matrix q times a matrix u. And q is, is, is got this property over here. It's got this property that the Q transpose times Q is equal to the identity matrix. So Q is, the transpose times, times Q is equal to its inverse. So its inverse is Q transpose. Well, when I do the, the, the estimate, now X estimate will, will turn out to be H prime transpose times H I don't have to worry about the R that's built in. So here's H prime transpose times H times H prime, which is again uh, transpose, U transpose, Q transpose. The interesting thing is that in, in the middle here, I'm multiplying Q transpose times Q. Well, that means that this, this goes out and it's an, it's an identity, so I just have U transpose u inverse times u transpose and I call z prime equal to u times x estimate and now I have this much simpler looking solution over here and it turns out that the u matrix is one that's always partially upper diagonal meaning there's there's no uh, it's an upper triangular matrix it's it's uh, it's only got diagonal terms and terms above the diagonal, everything else below is zero. And so it looks like this. Well, it turns out solving one like that can be done very, very simply. And there's, a, there's an algorithm that'll give us the uh, solution in the, in, and this is actually called the, the orthogonal decomposition or QR algorithm in, the, in MATLAB. So if I took H and I took R, here's my, my minus 20, and I put these the 32 and the 72 into the to the Z and I put zero. This is the this is the value that I'm trying to get out of this. And I solve it, I get 30.3, I get 20 72.71, and I get zero out of this guy here. Whatever's going in is what's coming out of that substation. So it gives me this zero value. Uh, and orthogonal decomposition is the standard way to do uh, state estimation. Thank you very much.